All right, well, it is good to be in worship. It is good uh, to sing God's praises, to reflect upon God's word, and to consider what it might say to us as we seek to become the people that Jesus longs for us to be. So I woke up yesterday morning, and um, I, I, should, I should know better than this, but I immediately went to my emails, right? Um, and I don't know about you all, but like, you know, it's just kind of like what I do. And, and so um, one of the taglines for one of the emails that I got was this, which is why you shouldn't immediately go to your emails. It was, why are so many church leaders losing their faith? Happy Saturday to you, Paul Cunningham, right? I'm like, well, if you want, I mean, that's like clickbait, right? I mean, it's like, it's actually from a guy who I read some of his blogs occasionally, though a lot of them are very depressing. But I was like, I didn't even know church leaders were losing their faith, right? This is yet another problem I have to be worried about in my life now. Like, I know church leaders, I, I know pastors are leaving the churches, and there's all sorts of stress around leading a church and, and all sorts of that, that kind of stuff. But it was like, the, I was like, it just is staring me in the face of like, why are pastors losing their faith? Now, I have to admit to you, I did not read the whole blog post, okay? But there was something in there that was super important as to what I'm actually preaching about this morning. This is the way, the weird way God works. Like you have your opening illustration all figured out and then you wake up Saturday morning and God's like, surprise, you got a whole new opening illustration, right? So I'll just save the one I had for today for another day and I shouldn't, shh, I shouldn't tell you stuff like that, right? But, but the, 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 the line that caught my eye was this. People confuse, or pastors confuse, or leaders confuse what they do with who they are. And I think that's true for many of us. Like when we think about our identity, we confuse what we do, our work, all our volunteering, where it is that we spend our time with who we are in Jesus. And that's really kind of the thrust of where I want to go this morning as we're talking about this idea of identity. This idea of what, it, what does it mean to be in Jesus? We're really good about talking about doing. Like it's one of the first things that comes up in a conversation, right? When you meet somebody new and the question is, you never any ask anybody, well, who are you really, right? I, I very rarely get asked that by anybody, but it immediately becomes, well, what do you do? And of course, I have a great line, I'm a pastor, because that, that's a great way of like, it, people go in all sorts of different directions when you tell them you're a pastor. So I just say, I'm a communicator, right? Okay, I don't say that. But the question is around this of, when we identify ourselves by what it is that we do, we, 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 we have some, some dangerous things or some traps that we can fall into. And, and, and the bottom line is this, is that many of us, and, and we have to be careful of this, many of us operate out of our gifting rather than out of grace. Because we're good at certain things, whether it's a spiritual gift, whether it's just something you were born with. I mean, there, there's different ways that, that all of a sudden, and you get praised for operating out of your gifts. Preachers can fall into this very easily. Because what you all see and what you all want and what you want in a teacher who stands on this stage or a preacher who stands on this stage is you want someone who can communicate very well. <clears throat> You want someone who has been given the gift of proclaiming God's word. But the trap side of that is that because preachers have that gift and teachers have that gift, they can begin to rely completely on the gift and not on the grace of Jesus who ultimately supplies that gift. And I can operate or you can operate out of your gifting and not out of grace. And guess what? No one knows. Because what they see is the person up front, the person on the stage, the person doing that task. And so there's a trap. And I think that's what this blog post was getting at, is saying, 
we have to be cautious of identifying ourselves by what we do rather than by who we are in Jesus. So our aim this fall, and as you see on the video and as we've been talking about, we want to talk about what does it mean to be spiritually formed by God? What does it mean to be a fully devoted disciple, fully devoted follower of Jesus? So we launched this series a couple weeks ago, and I said, our aim is this. There's three things. And, 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 and as I said last week, I don't always build, have sermon series that kind of build on each other. But this one, the first couple weeks are pretty important because if we are going to be truly spiritually formed by God, we have, to, we have to know a couple things. First of all, we have to know what is it that we are after. Like if we want to be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, what, what is our aim? And we talked about how the apostle Paul said, I want to present people fully mature in Christ. That was it. He said, I'll, I'll do everything that I have, anything that I can to present people fully mature in Jesus Christ. That's our aim. And if that is our aim, that means a couple of things. It means three things that I talked about. It means, first of all, we have to be all in. Like if we want to be formed by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have to be all in. Now, the, the, the problem of being all in, is, which is the second thing we have to pay attention to, is there are all sorts of distractions in our world and in our society. All sorts of clickbait that we get, right? All sorts, y'all know clickbait, right? Go home and Google it if you don't know it, okay? Um, but it's like the email I got. It's like, hey, here's this line. I got to click on this and see, hey, what is this going to tell me? There's all sorts of distractions that pull us away from the feet of Jesus. And so we have to be so intentional about keep going back to the feet of Jesus. And the third thing is that the aim of our lives is to live out the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, talking about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So that's where we begin. Last week, okay, bonus points this morning. What I talk about last week? I talked about my dear friend Elsa, older woman in my first church, who looked at me and basically said, you matter to God, I see you. So if we're going to talk about formation, we have to understand something, that we are known and loved by God. He knows you, he loves you, he sees you. You matter to God. So building on that then, now we get to the topic for this morning, which is talking about our identity. Talking about who we are in Jesus. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter. It's an incredible text. The first chapter, or the first letter of Peter, the second chapter, verses 4 through 12. This letter is written around 62 or 63 AD, written to people living in Asia Minor, written in right before Nero comes to power. So there is some persecution of the believers, but there is not a lot at this point because Nero has not come to power and decided as the emperor to come after the Christians. But Peter writes to a group of believers, non-Jewish believers, Gentile believers who have come to faith in Jesus. He calls them the scattered exiles. And then he calls them to faith and says, you have to think about how you are going to live in the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of uncertainty, because you are exiled. This home where we live, this earth that we call home is truly not our home. Now, a lot of us have a hard time with that because we love our home and we love getting to live in San Diego and we love everything that it's all about, but it, this is, we're just on our way. We're resident aliens. We're making our way to one day being with Jesus. So the interesting thing that happens, and, and, and I think this is probably true for many of us as preachers, I go away, I plan out my sermon series, I pick a text, I have an idea of where I'm going to go with that text, but it's really not until the week before that I kind of go, okay, um, what exactly is this text going to say to me and what exactly is it that God needs to say to La Jolla Presbyterian Church? And, and, and so I, I, I was working my way through this text and I said, what's amazing in this text, because this is the way the Spirit of God, the way the Spirit of God works, is in those, those verses that we're going to look at, I'm going to divide them into three sections. Each of those verses begins with this idea of this is who you are in Jesus. And then as Peter writes, he then says, and this is the implications of a life that is in Jesus. It starts with the being. Remember how I began my sermon this morning? 
We're gonna talk about the being and not the doing. Well, we are gonna talk about the doing, but what really matters is the being, who I am in Jesus. And this is what Peter is going to describe. And then he's going to move on and say, and because you are in Jesus, this is then the implication of your life. But we've got, if we're gonna be formed by the power of the spirit, we have got to understand first and foremost that we are in Jesus, that this is where everything begins. Think about Jesus, and we're going to look a little bit more about this next week, so I don't want to go too far on this. But Jesus said to his disciples, come and be with me before you go and do anything. Come and travel with me. Come and watch me. I'm going to let you go and do, but first come and be. So that's where we're going this morning, talking about identity, seeing what it is that Peter has to say to the church and to us. So we are in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to read just verses 4 and 5. And this is the being. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, speaking of Jesus here, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be, y'all, you're with me on this, right? Right? to be a holy priesthood, and then here comes the doing, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He says, you are like living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. This is the being. Now, it's interesting because he says both the being and the doing happen in community, Our faith is not lived in isolation, gathering, whether online, in person, whatever it is. We're made for community. And he says, we're being built into this house, but you, you, you're a part of this priesthood. Now, let's think through historically of that priesthood. We go way, 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 way back to the Old Testament and we think about the priests of Israel. There's a high priest of Israel, but there's also the priests that gather. But the language that is used around what it was that the priests were supposed to do actually goes back even further. Do you remember the first person in the Bible? You don't have to shout this out loud because I know you all know the answer, but the first person in the Bible that's given a priestly task. I know you all are thinking Adam, right? I can't tell if you're nodding your head. The lights are right in my eyes right now, so I can't tell if you're nodding your head, if you're asleep, if there's any, any movement out there at all. So just give me a nod like this. Yes, Paul. Yes, yes, we're with you. Okay. The first person given the priestly role is Adam. And we don't, we don't realize that because when you go and you read it, which we're going to do right now in, in This is uh, Genesis chapter two, verse 15. The Lord God took the man, took Adam, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. To work it and take care of it. Perhaps a more accurate description of this would be to serve in the garden and to guard the garden. Because remember the garden is, 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 is symbolic. It reminds us of the temple that one day exists or the, or the tabernacle that one day exists and the roles of the priests with the tabernacle and the temple that they were to guard the temple and they were to serve the temple. Well, how do you serve? Well, a priest serves by offering the sacrifices. How does Adam serve? Well, Adam serves by caring for the land, caring for the animals, naming the animals. This is a priestly role that is given to Adam and then he is to guard the garden. So what was one of the failures of Adam? Not just eating the fruit, because that came second. He didn't keep the serpent out of the garden. He allowed evil to get in and deceive. And so the role of the priest was not just to serve the Lord with sacrifices, but also to guard the teachings of Israel and to guard the people. And if you were a priest... Now we're not just talking about Adam and Eve, but we are talking about Adam pre-fall. If you were a priest, you had a clear connection 
to God. Everybody else had to go through you. But as a priest, you were connected to God. And you were the only group of people that were connected to God like that. So when Peter says, and you see, we have to, we have to go back in history. This is why knowing our Old Testament is important. Because when, when we go back and we're like, okay, what does it mean to be a priest? We hear the word priest, and we're like, great, a priest, a, a leader of a church, probably in the Catholic church, but it could be a different denomination. We, we don't think about, no, the priestly role was to serve and to guard. The priestly role was to be involved in God's creation. The priestly role meant that you had a direct connection with God. And so when Peter looks at that, those scattered exiles throughout Asia Minor, he says to them, you are a priesthood, each and every one of you have a priestly role, which means you get to connect directly with God. So who am I? Who are you? You're a priest. Now, bonus point time. When you hear the word pontifex, who do you think of? Who or what do you think of? I think you're all mumbling the Pope. I know it's kind of stuffy in here this morning and you don't have a lot of oxygen in your lungs. So I'm gonna, t- I'm gonna ask the question a little differently. Whose Twitter handle is Pontifex? The Pope, right? Now see, now you're learning something today, right? Here's the bonus question though. When you go back and you look at that word Pontifex, it is from the Latin language, what does it mean? Bridge builder, 100 points for somebody over here. I don't know who said that, but I am super impressed with that. Bridge builder. So what is the role, not just of the pontifex, we think of pontifex, if you go back historically, it meant the priest, it meant the, lead, it meant the bishops of the Catholic church. It wasn't just the Pope. It was all those who were in the bishop family or in the priestly family. Their role were, was to be a bridge builder. Peter looks at you and me and says, okay, this is who you are. You are a priest in Christ. You have clear connection with Jesus. You guard and you serve and you know what ultimately you are. You get to build bridges. What is it that we as Christians ought to be doing? Building bridges, building paths into our community. Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. The apostle Paul puts this a little bit differently. But it's this idea of what we are to do and what we are to be about. Therefore, I urge you, verses one and two, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. This is the the movement of formation in your life, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is what it looks like to live out the priestly lifestyle. We are becoming that, is what Peter would say. But Peter's not done yet, because he's still got a couple other things he wants to talk about being. So now we're back to verse 6 from our text for this morning. This great line that we're not going to spend a lot of time on, because this isn't the, the focus of the sermon today, although we could spend all day here. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious... But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But now here's what I want to look at. Verse 9. But you, here's a being statement again, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, there's that word again, a holy nation, God's special possession, And then here's the doing, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life, light. Chosen people, 
royal priesthood, holy nation, special possession of God. Peter again goes back to the Old Testament. And this time he goes back to Exodus chapter 19. And he basically quotes a lot of this almost verbatim. But this is what God has Moses say to the nation of Israel as they're making their way. And God wants them to understand who they are. Not so much what they have done or what they are going to do, but they've got to be grounded in their identity. They have to know who they are. So then we read this, verse three. Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings, brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you're to speak to the Israelites. God is saying, I am choosing you. Your identity is because of me. And sometimes we lose sight of that there is a difference between being chosen and being the choice one. Sometimes the church has lost its way of saying, well, we're chosen, which means we're number one and everybody else is not. We have to be careful of that thinking. That's not the focus of my sermon this morning, but I just want to point that out. But God looks at Israel and says, you're chosen. You're my special possession. Sometimes that's translated peculiar treasure. And it's getting to this idea that it is a, we are a unique treasure that God is saying that, that, that I have created you and I have formed you and I formed you for community. You need to be with one another. So Shannon and I have been watching um, Amazon's $15 billion project or how much of the money they spent on the Lord of the Rings. Anybody else been watching? <sighs> I see one. All right. Do I have two? Does anybody want? Y'all aren't watching Lord of the Rings? Oh, okay. Here goes another sermon illustration. Right? Like, okay, so I'm just going to give you a little background. There's not a big illustration around this, but there's a really important part of this story. And it's all about the power of the ring. So it's back thousands of years before our good friend Frodo and Bilbo Baggins, the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, right? Okay. All right. Glad you all are with me on that because that's where the illustration's going, right? But it's telling this, and it's, it is awesome. Like if you have Amazon Prime, I highly, highly recommend, I mean, just the cinematography and, and the, I mean, it's, okay. I'm a Tolkien geek, okay? I'm sorry, I, I, will, I will back that up. Tolkien and, and Lewis, both, I'm both geeks on both of those. Anyway, but as, I, as we're watching it, it, it brought back the memory of like the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, and that great trilogy that Tolkien writes is, I mean, it, it, it's fascinating, like his theology and his understanding. And, and, and if you remember the first of the, of the Lord of the Rings book, it's called The Fellowship of the Ring. So the, the, the series that just came out of Amazon, they're basically telling us how the rings got made, okay? Spoiler alert, in case you were really concerned about knowing what those were about. But then you go back, you advance thousands of years, and now you, you've got this, this, this ring that has to be destroyed. And Frodo Baggins, the Hobbit, Hobbits are great. Like, some days I wish I was a Hobbit. Like, just mind my own business, do my own thing, go about the Shire, living in peace and happiness and wholeness. Doesn't that sound all right? Some, that, that, that sounds good. And then guess who shows up? Good old Gandalf the wizard, right? I got something for you to do. Oh, no, 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 no. I kind of like the Shire. It's nice. But what happens, and what I love in that first story, is there is a community that is formed around a purpose. The purpose was to get rid of the ring. But the community that is formed is fascinating. And it's an amazing thing that Tolkien's writing this back in the 50s and 60s. Because who is this community? It's not just humans. 
It's not just hobbits. It's not just dwarves. It's not just elves. It's not just a wizard. But that fellowship of the ring includes a dwarf, includes an elf, includes some hobbits, includes some humans, includes a wizard. And together, though they come from east and west and north and south, though they speak a different language, though they look different, though they act different, though they behave different, this wonderful, diverse community aligns around one purpose. And I think, what is the church? What is it to be a believer in Jesus? It is to figure out a way that we gather from east and west and north and south. We look different, we talk different, we sound different, we have different passions, but we are all united around one thing. To show the mercy of Jesus Christ to one another and to our world. And so Peter says to those church, those believers that are exiled, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession. This is who you are. I love how N.T. Wright says, okay, if that's who we are then, what are we to do? This is how he describes it. He says, we are called to be an angled mirror, reflecting God's wise order into the world and reflecting the praises of all creation back to the creator. Peter said, you are to declare the praises of God. N.T. Wright says, think about an angled mirror. It has two purposes. We help people to see God's goodness and God's creation. But we're angled, so we also offer back to God the praise God deserves. And we do that because we have been chosen. We do belong. Well, Peter's not done because he's got one more thing that he wants to share. This is verses 10 through 12. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's the being statement. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which weigh war, wage war against your soul. And then this, this is the doing. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's the identity. It's who we are. It's not what we're doing. But there are some traps. There are some, some dangers with identity. So how many of you, okay, I didn't do very well with the Hobbit, Lord of the Rings thing. We'll try, we'll try something else. How many of you have heard of the concept of stolen valor? If you haven't heard of the concept of stolen valor, you are probably aware of it. Lots of articles written about this, lots of YouTube videos about this. This is when people pretend as though they have served in the armed forces and they wear the medals and the patches, and they talk about serving, and they talk about being a POW, and they talk about their valor, and all of it is fake. And like I said, there have been all sorts of stories and videos on this and articles written about this, and it's terrible. 
because they're dressing up and pretending to be someone they're not. And it's easy to point the finger at that and say, that disgusts me, and rightly so. But how many of us have our own stolen valor? How many of us dress and talk and live in such a way that really doesn't represent who we are? And we're trying to fake it. That's stolen valor. And a lot of people you know are doing that. We put on the facade that all is well when all is not well. Another danger is this. It's the imposter syndrome. Anyone got the imposter syndrome? We know this one, right? What if they find out, I really don't know how to lead a church? What if they find out, I don't have a clue what I'm doing? I'm using it in the first person, but you can use it in the first person. I don't think that's what you would say. What if people find out, I'm actually a fraud? I'm, now, I'm not confessing this today, okay? Like, if you all of a sudden you're like, Oh, crud, Paul talked about why pastors leave the ministry, right? I'm not going there, okay? So none of you made that connection, I'm guessing, right? Because you're like, that was 25 minutes ago, Cunningham. We already forgot what you said. But, um, that, that's, but I'm, I, I, want, I want to personalize it for you, though, because I remember doing leadership stuff years and years and years ago and saying to, to one of my, like, the guy I was working with, I was like, sometimes I think I'm just faking it. And he's like, that's called imposter syndrome. I'm like, oh, thank God there's a name for it, okay? Like, it's not true, but, but we get to that because our identity gets what? It's so caught up in what we're doing. And if I fail the mission, someone's gonna see me for who I really am, that I really don't know what I'm doing. And so I love what Peter says. He says, you're known and he pulls this text out of Hosea chapter 2, verse 33. And he's speaking to the nation of Israel, which has had a rough go of it, and they're not living well. And Hosea is, is telling this, this story, and I don't have time to get into all that story, but this line that Peter talks about, about being a people, is from Hosea. He says, I will plant, for myself, plant, plant her, this is speaking of Israel, for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one, because that's what happens earlier in Hosea. I will say to those, those called not my people, you are my, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. This is identity language. You are my people. I see you, is what God's saying. It's Diane's title of her art exhibit, Waiting to be Noticed. And God comes along and says, I see you. You are a part of the family. You belong. It's not about imposter syndrome. It's not about stolen valor. It's not about faking it till you make it. It's not about either showing a, showing a lifestyle that's fraudulent or fe feeling inside that you're fraudulent. God says, you're known and you're loved. This is the being. And then again, Peter says, and then there's the doing. Let those pagans be unable to figure out who you are and why you do what you do because your love is so great and your showing of mercy is so great. They cannot figure you out. And they have to look to the Savior to understand why it is that you live in such a way. So I'm going to close, close with this verse from 1 John chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. John's been speaking about love. He says, Therefore, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Building bridges, right? 
No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. No one has ever seen God. So how do people see God? They see God through your actions and my actions. When we are that deeply rooted in Jesus, we are able to go into the world to be bridge builders to extend the love of Jesus to one another, to be united together, no matter where we come from, of saying our focus is on serving the living God. Because as we say in our mission statement as a church, we want for you to experience the transforming love of Jesus so that you might then go and express it. Pray with me, please. Lord, for this day, we are grateful for the fact that you see us, you know us, you call us as your own. You say that we are your, your treasure, Lord. And we've done nothing to deserve that. So allow that to go deep inside of us, that we might be who you long for us to be, so that we might then go and do what you would have us do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.